definitely. I hope that I say something that unsettles you. That unnerves you, maybe even for a moment unhouses you. You all, I'm sure, take quite seriously here at King's State. The Socratic maxim, the unexamined life is not worth living. And that means that I hope at least once a semester, you recognize that maybe your worldview rests on pudding. I mean that you stop there, but just for that moment of intellectual dizziness and vertigo. Because that's what learning is all about in the deepest sense, not schooling, but being educated mind, body, and soul. So that when you come down, you do land on something that you're a different person than when you went up. The unexamined life is not worth living. Malcolm X is right when he adds the examined life is pain. That's precisely what this discussion about race and ethnicity and going through it, as Brother Karras once says, but not ending up there. Great Josiah Royce, towering American philosopher, born in California, taught at Harvard for about 42 years. He talked about the spirituality of genuine doubting, seeking, and interrogating. What I'd like to do is to join that kind of spirituality of doubting with what you heard earlier from Karras One, which is also a spirituality of giving, serving, loving, because this brother has a deep love in his heart that takes the form of a passion to communicate it, mediated by art, but still trying to change the world in the curriculum that looks primarily to Athens and Jerusalem rather than Asia and Africa and indigenous peoples and of course Athens and Jerusalem has much to teach us but they have no monopoly on the truths of the human condition we try to join Socrates who went about what? questioning, interrogating but did Socrates ever cry? Plato, Xenophon Aristophanes, no tears of Socrates. Interesting. He never cried, he probably never loved. He never loved for me, I'm not sure what a brother really lived. He questioned, but did he really live on the ground? Where it hurts, loss, mourning, grief, sadness, sorrow, heartbreak, heartache, not just raising interesting theoretical and abstract questions. We got to bring Socrates down. Move to Jerusalem, Elijah. Kirk Jesus weeps. Why do they weep? Because they love so. They're investigated in something. They're self-involved in something. They're attached they're interested, they care. Something is at stake in the lives that they live. Talk about race, not just in America, but in the world, because no one would conceive of the notion of race until the 17th century. Francois Bernier first put it forward in 1688, a moment in which what? A moment in which Europe is shaping the world in its own image, controlling nearly two-thirds of the globe, doing itself as not just superior, but casting itself in terms of arbitrary constructs like whiteness, blackness, redness, yellowness, brownness, and it becomes part and parcel all this notion that somehow those cast as black, brown, yellow, red are inferior, less beautiful, less intelligent, less moral. What a lie, but my God, that lie is taking on tremendous ferocity. And it's still around. 
nobody's concerned about the intelligence of those who have blue eyes as opposed to brown eyes. You can't get a dissertation in the psychology department pursuing that question. Who cares about the intelligence of those in Georgia as opposed to those in North Dakota? You can't get a PhD dissertation in psychology comparing the intelligence of those in Georgia versus North Carolina or North Dakota. But you raise black and white, oh, this is a very serious issue now. Let's see what the evidence I know it's going to be tough and delicate for some of you all, but uh, let, 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 let's see where the evidence goes. Where does the question come from? Women as intelligent as men. Oh, that's a very serious question. I think it's going to be tough on the sisters, but uh, let's pursue it. That's the way science is. Sure, 2,000 years of patriarchy. We know what the framework looks like. We know why that question is so relevant. Photosoft. Tradition. of the human family forces us to raise the deepest questions, the most frightening and terrifying questions about us. And that question is, what does it really mean to be human? Most of us don't have time to wrestle with that question. I know many of you all at this grand institution, you work in one job, two jobs, three jobs, you get courses, you try to fall in and out of love. I raise the question of what does it mean to be human and I don't get a grade for it that'll help me in my quest for a job. But here come some hip art, hip hop figures and rap musicians that say there's a long tradition that says those of us on the underside of a society, on the night side of American life on the dark side of the human predicament are going to force us to wrestle with some questions. Let us never forget that our English word human comes from the Latin humando, which means burying. I always like to remind professors of humanities what they're, what they're all about. Burying bodies coffins, grave diggers as in Shakespeare's Hamlet, we are featherless, two-legged, linguistically conscious creatures born between urine and feces, that's us, looking for a little meaning and value and care as we face inevitable, unavoidable and inescapable extinction. question of what it means to be human, it cuts so much deeper than race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, class position, regional position, whether you're disabled and physically challenged, older or younger, and yet we know those constructs and categories do have tremendous weight in regard to how we ultimately answer the question of what it means. Hip hop generation associated with like the clip. The clip reminded me we all emerge in the funk. Right? No matter what color we are, we emerge in the stink and the stench, and that love push got us out. You might feel a little sophisticated and refined now, but you were just like Rockefeller and just like the homeless brother when you emerged. across the 
the future of American democracy. And of course, we live in the world. The three wealthiest individuals in the world have more wealth than the bottom 48 nations. The top 225 individuals have more wealth than the bottom 48% of all of humankind alive, which is 2.6 billion people. Ethiopia and its suffering is just the peak of an iceberg that's linked to both decrepit leadership, too often predominant on the continent itself, linked to World Bank IMF policies that impose austere conditions, full access to credit that downplays education, health job skills what a world thank god that there was some voices crying out in the wilderness called hip-hop artists and rap musicians that said america may be in a moment of self-celebration and self-congratulation because wall street's going crazy and the stock market's setting records and the top one percent are euphoric and the top 20 percent are ecstatic but there's some people down here who's living every day and we're going to focus on their situation as well we want our voice to be heard or in the tradition of the national negro anthem written by james well and johnson and rosamond johnson lift every voice every voice to be part of a decision making process so that maybe we can get to some Quality and democracy through this prism of race and ethnicity, and that's the challenge for us, and that's what we're going to be talking about this evening. Thank you all so much.